is this place that we call civilization? How did it develop? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where will we end up? Historian Arnold Toynbee said, Civilization is a movement and not a condition, a voyage and not a harbor. What we do know is that there have been civilizations before us, and most likely there will be civilizations after we are gone. Our society appears transfixed on the idea that one day we will awaken to find that our great civilizations, like those in the past, have come to pass as well. There is a fascination with the horrors of civilization being lost. This may account for the great recent interest in zombies, those people surviving some holocaust only to become some kind of mutated version of mankind. Late physicist C.P. Snow once said, Civilization is hideously fragile. There's not much between us and the horrors underneath. Just about a coat of varnish. Popular media abounds with stories about fictional natural disasters. Many point to the horrors of nature's capability to destroy everything that gets in its path. Religious scholars sometimes point at the rise of disasters caused at the hand of nature as proof that our world is not only fragile, but may come to a quick and sudden end. The ability to get food is something we often take at times for granted, yet it's not now nor has it ever been a guaranteed endless supply. An unknown author once stated, "Man." Despite his artistic pretensions, his sophistication, and his many accomplishments, owes his existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. So, what is civilization and society, and what makes them so different from one another even though we share the same earth? Jared Diamond explains, the broadest pattern of history, namely the differences between human societies on different continents, seems to me to be attributable to differences among continental environments and not to biological differences among peoples themselves. History is our own unique explanation of what mankind was, is, and a wondering of what will become. The Big Picture, Defining a Millennium it is difficult to see when one phase of human history ends and another begins. It's not as if someone is walking around one day and says, Hey, I'm tired of living in the classical period. Today will mark the beginning of the post-classical period. Between about 200 and 850 CE, many classical states and civilizations were disrupted, declined, or collapsed. Invasions, economic collapse, and diseases were among the many players who helped to shatter the civilization of Rome. For the average person living in these empires, there probably was little awareness of the fact that the civilization was falling apart. The change was incredibly gradual, with a few big events such as the mysterious plague that struck Athens in 430 BCE. Columbus's transatlantic voyages around 1500 mark a new departure in world history for most people. Lives would rapidly change as the discovery of new foods, cultures, and technology came on the scene. The third major wave of civilizations had come to its apex as trade and wealth became the prime motivators for change rather than the need to simply survive. The desire for luxury goods for the wealthy and a growing need for wealth to continue the conquest of new empires is a hallmark of these civilizations. A new set of continents unexplored by those from Europe and Asia would stir imaginations and lead to an unprecedented volume of travels abroad. So how should we understand the millennium that stretches from the end of the classical era to the beginning of modern world history? It has proven hard to define a distinct identity for this period. Some call it post-classical, but that term has little meaning. Some call it medieval but that term is Eurocentric and also suggests that it was just a lead-in to modernity. This textbook sometimes uses the phrase third wave civilizations. Milton Friedman said, The world runs on individuals pursuing their self-interest. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. 
Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. Various regions followed different trajectories in this area. There were several distinct patterns of development. Some areas saw creation of new but smaller civilizations where none had existed before. New societies such as East African Swahili civilization, Kievan Rus, and new civilizations in East and Southeast Asia are a few of the examples we will look at in this unit. All were part of the pattern of increasing globalization of civilization. The new civilizations were distinctive but similar to earlier civilization in that they borrowed heavily from earlier or more established centers. The most expansive and influential third wave civilization was Islam. Still, older civilizations persisted or were reconstructed. Byzantium, China, India, and the Niger Valley. In the Americas, the collapse of classical Maya civilization and Teotihuacan opened the way to a reshaping of an ancient civilization. The Inca formed an empire out of various centers of Andean civilization. In Western Europe, successor states tried to maintain links to older Greco-Roman Christian traditions, but they developed far more decentralized societies which emerged led by Germans. The result was a hybrid civilization created of classical and Germanic elements that experienced the development of highly competitive states after 1000 CE. Franklin Roosevelt stated, If civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the abilities of all peoples of all kinds to live together in the same world at peace. An important common theme is the great increase in interaction between the world's regions, cultures, and peoples. Increasingly, change was caused by contact with strangers and or their ideas, armies, goods, or diseases. Cosmopolitan regions emerged in a variety of places. We call those mini-globalizations. Part 3 highlights the accelerating pace of interaction in the third wave era, giving special attention to three major mechanisms of interaction. Three mechanisms of interaction include trade, especially the growth of long-distance commerce. Trade led to the establishment of many new states or empires. Diffusion of religious ideas, technologies, and germs also moved large empires incorporating many distinct cultures under a single political system. Empires provided security for long-distance trade, and many of the third-wave civilizations were larger than earlier ones. For example, the Arab, the Mongol, and Inca empires. The largest empires were created by nomadic or pastoral peoples, the Arabs, Turks, and Mongols, and Aztecs, who ruled over agriculturalists along trade routes. Large-scale empires and long-distance trade worked together to facilitate the spread of ideas, technologies, crops, and germs. These empires included wide diffusion of religions. Another consideration is wide diffusion of technologies, many from China and India that still negative consequences such as the devastating epidemic disease, Black Death, linked to distant communities. A focus on accelerating connections puts a spotlight on travelers rather than on those who stayed at home. Finally, the focus on interaction raises questions for world historians about how much choice individuals or societies had in accepting new ideas or practices and about how they made those decisions. Jared Diamond is quoted, The rate of human invention is faster, and the rate of cultural loss is slower in areas occupied by many competing societies with many individuals and in contact with societies elsewhere. Thank you.